The hallowed pages of Shonen Jump have long played host to the greatest heroes in all of anime. Goku, Saiyan conqueror turned Earth's and eventually the whole universe's savior. Yusuke Rameshi, a good-for-nothing punk given a precious second chance after heroically sacrificing his own life. Tanjiro Kamado, who fights monsters so that no one else need ever lose their families like he did, but who never lets the tragedy all around him rob him of his trademark empathy. Young Emma, driven to defy her own mother and the entire world if that's what it takes to save her family. Monkey D. Luffy, who sticks with his friends to the bitter end and stares down tyranny with a cocky grin. Now, a new face joins this vaunted pantheon, one that will soon be as famous as all the others for her great deeds and irresistible charisma both. A legendary heroine whose name will echo through the ages, synonymous with animated action, adventure, and daring do. And that name is Anya. She likes peanuts. Oi! Dame da to ittaru! Ora, soko! Barenai to omotte no ga! Soko! Soko! Spy family, or Spy X family, or possibly Spike's family, has taken the seasonal anime world by storm. In the three weeks since it premiered, it's already caused a scoring war with the FMA fanboys over on MAL, and racked up more viewers than Kaguya-sama Season 3, and even the rise up of the gamer hero. It is literally every post on r slash Annie memes, and Twitter and TikTok absolutely adore it, despite what rage-baiting click farmers who don't know what a troll post is would have you believe. In Japan, the manga just pulled a Demon Slayer and had every available volume in the Oricon Top 20 sales charts, and the first episode pulled in the most viewers of any anime that week. There is clearly something about this anime that grabs people and just does not let go. And as a guy who was grabbed by the manga before it was cool, and I have YouTube upload date receipts to prove it, bow before the incredible prescience of my recommendations. And also uh, ignore the two manga in that video that got tragically canceled within like a month of me uploading it. What was I talking about again? Right. I think I'm uniquely qualified to analyze the secret sauce behind Spy Family's success. Now, some might argue there's no need for such analysis, because the anime's innate appeal is just so self-evident. It is cutesy kitty funny, but also dark and effed up PG-13 funny, and the overarching plot is actually pretty nuanced and compelling when you look at it, but also there's lots of kung fu and shootouts and car chases and gadgets and explosions and all that good spy movie shit. The music slaps, the animation's fantastic, and it's all wrapped up in a wholesome, family-friendly package, but also, speaking of wrapped up, have you, uh, seen the dress on Mommy? I mean... Mommy? I mean, m your? Honestly, I might have to dock the director points for putting that outfit in these action scenes. I mean, how am I supposed to choose what to gawk at, man? Think about your user experience next time. But then, speaking of that dress, I bet someone who knows a lot more about fashion and probably chair history than me could write a whole other video essay about how Tatsuya Endo's artwork anachronistically blends modern sensibilities with the 60s mod aesthetics of golden age spy films to create something that feels at once like a callback and its own distinctly modern thing. And it's intrusive video essayist thoughts like that that make me think there's gotta be more to Spy Family's appeal than cute and funny and violent and also cool and good at all those things at the same time. I mean, there kinda needs to be if you think about it, because without carefully considered narrative execution, those disparate elements would clash instead of working in concert like they do. In order to work at all, Spy Family needs to have the tightly tuned characters of a high-end situational comedy, the world-building chops of a fraught political thriller, and a strong enough thematic and aesthetic identity to pull it all together into one cohesive and distinctive whole. Plus, a strong enough emotional core to make you care about what happens to its characters, even as you're laughing at them for being dummies who can't social situate 
situation right. Luckily, Tatsuya Endo has a gift for crafting complex, believable characters who bring out each other's funniest qualities with naturalistic ease. Just the basic concept for the series' core trio of characters is an absolute comedic goldmine. An emotionally detached, pathologically professional secret agent is forced by the dictates of his mission to share a home and sometimes bed with an irresistibly bubbly cinnamon roll of a waifu whose pure, blushing innocence could thaw even the iciest spy's heart, and also she's secretly a professional murderer. And if that weren't complicated enough, they both have to care for an agent of peanut-fueled pink-haired chaos who just so happens to be a telepath and thus knows both of their secrets, which she, naturally, thinks are awesome because she's six and addicted to Inspector Gadget. Lloyd, Anya, and Yor are all wonderfully entertaining characters by themselves, especially Anya, but when you put them in the same room, they instantly begin dragging each other out of their respective comfort zones and into the space where comedy happens. Lloyd has lived his entire life in a world of shadows, unbound by human attachment, relying only on his own wits to survive, so simply being in the same room with other human beings who like and need him is unfamiliar territory by itself. And on top of that, the fact that his extremely important mission to stop the Cold War from going hot hinges on two untrained strangers causes the meticulous planner no small quantity of comic consternation. But what really throws him off his game is the fact that he actually, like, cares about Anya a lot despite himself, because how could anyone not? She is perfect. Just look at her. And while he's callously used and discarded countless pretty young socialites to maintain his disguises, Twilight likewise finds himself irresistibly drawn to his new fake wife, Yor, because how could he not be? She is perfect. Just look at her. But also, when you move past that superficial stuff, Lloyd and Yor obviously have a lot in common, what with how they both lead secret double lives in an effort to avert the sort of war that left both of them as orphans. Also, as a result of those tragic backstories, neither of them has any real experience with romance or normal family life, which means they're often hilariously bad at it, though bad in different and complementary ways. Lloyd is extremely dishonest and guarded for obvious reasons. You'd need to push deep to connect with anything remotely authentic with that guy. Anya is able to slip past those defenses easily by literally reading his mind, but Yor is also quite adept at pulling his walls down because her life as a socially reclusive assassin has left her without much sense for boundaries or the social norms that Twilight normally exploits to manipulate others. She she is extremely, almost violently blunt sometimes, as only a naive, pure-hearted cinnamon roll who has tasted human blood can be. Anya, meanwhile, possesses the bluntness of a precocious child, confident, direct, and frequently wrong about almost everything, except the things that she gleans from her telepathy, which would be a pretty big advantage for most people, but Anya sits in that same character build sweet spot as Jojo Part 4's Okuyasu, where she possesses an incredible power but only has about half the intelligence stats she needs to use it effectively. This is, objectively, the funniest kind of character you can put in a shonen anime, and in the specific context of this one, it allows Anya to act as the glue that binds the whole forger family together and nudge the plot occasionally in positive directions without being so capable as to render her parents irrelevant to the plot. Her decidedly average intellect also makes her an ideal 
ideally relatable POV character for the younger portion of Spy Family's audience, the one voice in the room who can ignore the fraught political intrigue and complicated moral dimensions of the plot that's happening to say what we're all really thinking. Namely, wow, that sure was a cool explosion. More please. But of course, family fun time interrupted by Mission Impossible action is just the default baseline spy family experience. This is a story with variety. Each member of the Forger clan has their own group of equally well-designed supporting characters who are purpose-built to play off their unique character quirks and also have some fun interactions with the rest of the family. Twilight has his spy agency contacts, plus his only real friend, Frankie, who also happens to be the only character in the cast who can match Anya wit for wit, as well as various rivals and enemies in the world of espionage at large. Most folks, your meets on the job wouldn't really work as recurring characters on account of how dead they all are, but her co-workers at her fake job are a catty, water-cooler, chatty cast straight out of an office sitcom that the socially stunted killer doesn't know how to deal with at all. That's pretty funny, but what's really funny is her little brother, Yuri, who has a little bit of a sister complex thing going on, so obviously that creates some tension with Lloyd, and also, well, the anime hasn't gotten there yet, but trust me, he's very fun. Speaking of things the anime hasn't really gotten to, the most fleshed out part of the setting, aside from the Forger household, obviously, is undoubtedly Eden Academy, the snooty rich kid school that Anya must infiltrate and conquer academically if Operation Strix is ever to succeed, which her aforementioned low intelligence stats already make an unlikely prospect, but on top of that, she's got to navigate a social web of selfish, spoiled brats without going all Monkey D. Luffy on their Charlo sasses, which is much easier said than done. The kids in Anya's orbit all have extremely colorful and entertaining personalities, as do the zealously traditional faculty members tasked with molding them into future leaders of Austanian society. And given how much time Anya ends up spending at the school, approximately like half the manga's entire runtime, I could spend even longer analyzing the intricately humorous social dynamics that make that setting so funny. But like I said, the anime hasn't gotten there yet, and I don't want to spoil any good jokes for you anime onlys. Plus, cutting and motion graphicifying all these manga panels is a lot of work for my editors that I'd rather spare them. But that also makes it kind of tough to talk about the more serious and emotional elements we see come up later in the series. The parts that give the manga its texture, make it feel every bit as thrilling and intense as any more serious spy flick I can name, and ultimately mark it out as one of the best stories ever printed in the pages of Jump. Actually, I think it started on the website. That ah, doesn't matter. So instead of tiptoeing through the spoiler minefield to explain all that to you, I'm just gonna go off on a wild tangent about the whole shonen manga and anime ecosystem and the one genre that reigns eternal as its true apex predator. And eventually I will tie that all back to Spy Family, plus some other good anime that you should also totally be watching this season, but it'll be a while until then, so to tide you over, please enjoy this clip of authentic, high-quality Spy Family content that's definitely not a slap-together G Fuel ad. Hey, what do you want from this store that we are in, Anya? I want that G Fuel. New moist critical peach flavor, please. Give it to me right here in my mouth now. I need the energy and also the focus aminos especially. But Anya, didn't you know? It is cheaper to buy a G Fuel if you use the promo code BASEMENT at checkout at gfuel.com, link in the doobly-doo, to get 30% off an order of any size. Wow, that is handy info, father. Do you know that? Cause you are a spy? Y you mean spy psychiatrist, right? No. If you were to ask an anime fan, what is the most powerful genre of anime, they'd probably ask you to clarify what you mean by that, at which point you'd say, I mean the genre of anime slash manga that does the most to drive those mediums forward artistically. And following that, you'd get a number of answers. 
thirsty otaku will immediately point to hentai or isekai and harem anime if they want to hide their power levels. Business-minded weebs will tell you it's mecha, idol anime, and Pokemon. Uh, creatures of hype will immediately point to the decades-long rating dominance of shonen battle behemoths. And a rare few who actually know what they're talking about will give you the correct answer which is gag manga. If you measure an anime's success by how long it's been on the air, this isn't even a close contest. Clocking in at 7,881 episodes, or 2,500 when you consolidate those eight-minute shorts into half-hour blocks, Forkoma gag manga adaptation Sazai-san is the longest-running anime in history by several country miles. And from Nintama Rantaro in distant second, all the way down to Sekai Monoshiri Ryoko, just about every anime in the thousand plus episode club is either a gag manga adaptation or a children's comedy show, with the lone exception being Case Closed, a formulaic mystery series with heavy comedic elements. But wait, I hear you typing down in the comments, One Piece is also not a gag manga. And all I can say to that is, are you sure? What's the last chapter you read? Gag manga are Shonen Jump's real bread and butter. Anyone who reads the magazine currently knows that Robico really runs the show, and even if you can't read, you need look no further for proof than the most upvotedest franchise on MAL and the unofficial fourth member of the Big Three, Gintama. Hell, the father of martial arts manga himself, Akira Toriyama, had a mountain of fuck you money before Dragon Ball was even a twinkle in his eye, thanks to the industry-shaking power of Dr. Slump, which Dragon Ball fans may know as the show that that little girl who scares the shit out of Vegeta came from. Every battle manga at least acknowledges that gag manga protagonists lie beyond the scope of traditional power scaling systems. Usually this recognition happens in non-canon one-shots, but some mangaka who aren't cowards, like Akira Toriyama and Gege Akutami, will actually write gag characters into their serious storylines, and then explicitly point to that guy and say that he is canonically more powerful than Satoru Gojo. You should catch up with the Jujutsu Kaisen manga, it is very good. You might also remember that between the fall of the Big Three and the advent of Demon Slayer, the biggest straightforward battle series to emerge in the anime space was easily One Punch Man. A gag manga about an overpowered gag manga character in a shonen battle anime world that otherwise takes itself way too seriously. Now, some might look at these facts, this meme about gag characters being OP, and think nothing of it. Obviously, characters constrained by seriousness are handicapped against those who can do anything that would be funny right now, but it's actually a reflection of a deeper truth. Battle manga characters cannot defeat gag manga characters for the same reason that regular vampires cannot defy their progenitors. The entire shonen battle genre, training arcs, tournaments, rivalries, ancient sealed evils, transformations, the whole bit is just one big gag that Akira Toriyama took way, way too far. Look, I, I know it's hard for some Dragon Ball fans, especially the ones who irrationally hate cartoons to acknowledge, but Dragon Ball is a gag series at its core. Which makes sense, because the guy who made it just became a kajillionaire by writing one of those, and why not repeat that success? One of the first guys Goku fights is an evil rabbit wizard who can turn anything he touches into a carrot. The mighty demon king Piccolo was sealed away in a rice cooker. Krillin gets to the semifinals of the first tournament arc in manga history because his opponent is very stinky and he has no nose. And in that same tournament, Goku almost scores a ring out by making a guy fall over in reaction to a dumb thing he said. Actually, 
come to think of it, I I'm pretty sure Kanikumon did tournament arcs before Dragon Ball, but that's still a gag manga, so my point still stands. And it's not a coincidence that these awesome anime concepts, which are many people's personal favorite kind of anime concept, got their start in the funny papers. Humor has a way of putting audiences into a naturally receptive state of mind, where they're more willing to suspend disbelief for zany, over-the-top action and concepts, and more willing to see where stories are going with their big ideas instead of writing them off because it's not familiar or what you were expecting or wanted. And also, counterintuitively, humor can even make you more willing to engage with the emotional content of serious, sincere, or even sad story beats within comedies. This property of the genre lets creators play around with novel story structures and concepts that a less funny serialized narrative might not even be able to establish before interest fizzles out and it gets canceled. It was only after Toriyama proved that manga readers enjoy laser beam kung fu and seeing character names move up a bracket chart that more serious storytellers like Yoshihiro Togashi were able to explore the deeper narrative potential of those ideas. And Toriyama was also able to explore that potential to some extent, quite effectively actually, thanks to that counterintuitive effect I just mentioned. It's a pretty huge bummer when a main character dies in any kind of manga, even one where characters tend to drop like flies, like Attack on Titan, but there is something uniquely shocking and a little transgressive about the first time our little bald comic relief buddy Krillin gets brutally murdered by a demon after half a dozen arcs full of lighthearted scatological humor. Of course, that is just the first time that happens, and Dragon Ball wishes do kind of completely trivialize the concept of death as the series goes on, to the point that Goku may as well have just instantly translocated from the Cell games to the store to buy cigarettes for five years. But when you reread the manga, those first few still hit you like truck kun. And they hit despite being fairly cliche, cloying moments when you pull back and look at them as isolated scenes. If you saw a character's death handled that way in a series that wants you to take it even a little more seriously, you'd probably roll your eyes at it, maybe even make it a meme. Art can only affect us emotionally if we agree on at least an unconscious level to let it affect us. And it is much easier to convince most of us to go along with what an artist is doing if it seems like they're having fun with it. Otherwise, the media they're making has to be doing something that we're already emotionally invested in, like laser beam wrestling or jump scares or people crying. And because that emotional investment isn't always intrinsic to the work itself, but rather tied to its genre, such works risk losing parts of their audience every Every time they do something unexpected, especially if they don't execute on it well, which makes it kind of hard to try new things. That said, if it can successfully convince you to laugh on its own merits, not with cheap pop culture references or low effort shock gags that rely on external context to land, then a well constructed comedy can hook you in for a whole emotional roller coaster ride without really having to nail any one particular tone. But what happens, then, when a gag manga also manages to nail some of those other bits? Is this where I'm finally gonna segue back to the anime you actually clicked on this video for? Yes, but also there's four other ones of those airing this season, and along with Spy Family, those comedies comprise four of the top five highest rated currently airing shows on MAL. Five of the top six if you count One Piece, which is so good at executing executing on both comedy and everything else that many people don't even realize its entire epic fantasy narrative is ultimately just the world's longest shaggy dog setup for the world's greatest punchline, hidden somewhere on the island of Laugh Tale. As for the others, Kaguya-sama Love is War, in addition to being a laugh riot, is capable of revving up Kokoro's to Doki Doki Mach 5 as quickly as the tear-jerkiest of shoujo romances when its leads get serious, and it managed to deliver better coming-of-age drama than most teen drama anime through Yu Ishigami's cheerleading arc alone. Ya boy Kong Ming is gleefully ridiculous on
on every level with its premise of an ancient Chinese strategist becoming a music producer, yet it captures the melancholic yearning of the aspiring artist every bit as effectively as Blue Period or Kids on the Slope. And you know, as funny as Comey Can't Communicate can be, it's the emotional and relatable character arcs that really keep its audience coming back for more. In each of these shows, the comedy provides cover for powerfully sincere, personal, and introspective storytelling to hit you when you least expect it, and then press that advantage to devastating effect. There is real honesty to be found in these shows, an effort to speak to something deeper in the human condition than many grittier, bloodier, and sappier shows ever even try to touch, and that is well reflected in their well-deserved high scores. All that's true of Spy Family too, even the aspiring artist part, if you twist the definition of art to include cooking with a basic level of competence. That sounds like sarcasm, but th that bit in the manga really did make me tear up. A lot of bits in the manga have done that to me, actually, and you anime onlys have already gotten a taste of what they're like in that sweet moment at the end of episode one where Anya tucks herself in under her tuckered out papa's arm and they take a cozy little nap together, each feeling just a little bit more at home than they can probably ever remember feeling. You don't just come into being a spy or an assassin or an experimental telepathic runaway orphan from a happy, trouble-free childhood. Every member of the Forger family has brought their own heavy load of baggage into their little apartment, and while none of them wants to unpack any of theirs and spoil the family fun, it is still there, taking up space, getting in the way, and reminding them of long gone times. It's easy to forget when they're being so cute and funny, but these are fundamentally broken people living in a war-torn world who need each other to become whole again. And while that dynamic never overwhelms the comedic action-adventure fun, it is always present in the background, informing their characterization and giving rise to surprisingly frequent and quiet moments of heartwarming human beauty between all the belly laughs and explosions, sometimes even blurring the line between the three. And as those lines blur, so too do the ones between family and cover story. Fake or not, the forgers have forged something rare and precious for themselves in a hostile and uncertain world, something that's worth protecting not just for the sake of high-minded ideals like world peace, but because it's theirs and it makes them happy. A lie that is better and, in a sense, more real to them day to day than the truth. And while we may no longer live in a world of Cold War tensions between East and West, or so they tell us, anyway. I think pretty much everyone feels that way about the good things in their lives. And that, at least in my opinion, is the nugget of emotional truth that makes Spy Family's whole surreal sitcom scenario feel so oddly cozy and relatable. The thing that's resonating with so many viewers over here, in Japan, and around the world. I mean, it's either that or the tight dresses, hot dad, insanely cute mascot, cool explosions, and high-octane slapstick comedy. As a wise woman once said, Alright, I've hit the point where I've started just lazily quoting random memes at you and I'm pretty sure my editors are running out of usable footage from the episodes that are out, so I think it's about time we wrap this video up. I hope it helps you appreciate Spy Family and gag manga in general more than you did before, but if it doesn't, I'm very sorry. If I may let my own mask slip a bit at the old parasocial dinner table we're all sharing right now, you might have noticed that all of my shelves are out of this room since I last talked about moving in the last video, and I'm clearly still not. At least, not until my red-eye flight tonight. And that whole situation has me so tired that not even Anya's really helping at this moment, so 
I'm just trying to make the best video I can make to satisfy the mighty and insatiable algorithm given the current circumstances. Once we're settled though, please look forward to that Kaguya-sama video essay I promised you, the roasting of the shield hero, part three of the cult series, and even more cool stuff that Yazzie and I have planned. I'm Jeff Thu, aka Agent Mother's Basement, and this YouTube video will self-destruct in 17 seconds, so hit that like button and bell icon as fast as you can. Do it now! Don't think! Go! Go! Go!